Hello everyone. My name is Lauren Barrett. I'm a winemaking specialist with Anardis, and today in our on-demand series, we're going to be talking about wine instabilities, precipitate, and hazes. So in this series, we have two parts. Um, this is part one, where we're going to be going over clarity and sensory, and then looking at the categories and identification of common hazes and deposits, um, them being crystalline, amorphous, and microbiological. And then in the second part of this video series, we'll be going into more prevention and remediation. So part one, clarity and sensory. Now with clarity and sensory, we're really talking about the consumer perspective. And consumers have become habituated to perfectly clear wines at this point. Most mainstream wines are limpid, that means they're less than two NTU. Consumers also frequently mistake crystalline precipitates for glass fragments um, in white wines. Haziness is almost always considered a fault, although there is a growing acceptance for some natural wines. But in general, majority of wine consumers are going to look at haziness as being a fault. And it's also important to consider that some hazes and precipitates can actually impact other wine sensory components, such as texture, astringency, and acidity. So let's get into part one, uh, it's categories of common hazes and deposits. Now crystalline precipitates, most common are potassium bitartrate and calcium tartrate. There's also elagic acid, which um, is this needle shaped picture here on the right hand side. And some less common crystalline precipitates include um, the ones listed below, but for the most part, what we're going to be concerned about and going into more detail is um, potassium uh, by tartrate and calcium tartrate as well. Now, potassium by tartrate or KHT, um, it really will precipitate depending on the holding capacity, um, which is going to be made up of the alcohol, pH, temperature, storage time and various interactions with um, other macromolecules present that's going to affect the nucleation and induction time for potassium bitartrate to form. Um, here we have listed the potassium ranges in wine which is anywhere from 200 to 2000 milligrams per liter and calcium tartrate um, precipitates much slow, more slowly compared to KHT and is not as dependent on temperature. Um, there is some um, inhibitors to calcium tartrate precipitation, that is malic acid, wine polysaccharides, yeast manoproteins, and atom gum arabic can reduce the induction time. But unfortunately, it's quite a complex um, uh, issue for uh, the wine industry, being that it takes much longer to, um, to have these crystals nucleate. And so what happens frequently is four to six weeks after bottling, we can see the, see their presence and it mostly comes off as this very fine micronized almost uh, looking crystal compared to potassium bitartrate which is much more flaky um, and uh, not as fine as calcium tartrate. Calcium ranges in wine are from 6 to 165 milligrams per liter and at-risk wines include wines with a high pH um, in red wines, uh, calcium over 60 milligram per liter um, is an at-risk wine, depending on other factors such as pH and tartaric acid. And uh, also for white wines, anything above 80 milligrams per liter is going to be considered at risk. So amorphous protein deposits. Um, amorphous precipitates can be characterized as protein agglomerates that have a non-specific shape or morphology under ma magnification. Um, they include a consortium of different wine uh, compounds, um, anywhere from uh, proteins to polysaccharides, red wine pigments and tannins, and also include metallic hazes as well in this category. I highly recommend going um, to our resources listed in this uh, series. Uh, you can see that the Australian Wine Research Institute has a really great haze and deposit picture gallery, which you can look at to, to identify some of these deposits under a microscope if you have a microscope um, in your um, lab. Now with protein haze, this instability is mainly coming from grape pathogenesis related PR proteins that um, include chitinase and heat unstable thaumatin-like proteins, TLPs. And 
What's um, interesting about these proteins is that they're quite resistant to endogenous proteases. So, and this is mainly due to their structure. And what can happen is that they can self-aggregate depending on formation conditions. These formation conditions include the ionic strength, the temperature, any sort of pH shifts uh, in the presence of sulfite, uh, organic acids, polyphenols, condensed tannins, polysaccharides, these all can influence the shape and unfolding or refolding of these proteins, which then can induce aggregation and the formation of said haze. So um, this, this really should be addressed earlier on with the addition of exogenous protease enzymes and also look at finding, but we'll go into more detail with that in part two. Now we're going to be getting into metallic hazes, first starting off with iron and ferric case. In white wines, iron case comes off as a ferric phosphate white case. And what we see is amorphous white, off-white haze and flocculates. In red wine, it's called ferric tannat or blue case. So it's amorphous bluish haze, often misdiagnosed as tannin deposit. And the formation conditions for iron-induced hazes and instability really depend on wine's redox potential. Um, there's a colloidal reaction with Fe3 plus and phosphoric acid, as well as with uh, uh, tannic acid, which can lend to this blackish tinge. Um, and unfortunately, iron concentration in wine um, is not sufficient in predicting um, these instabilities. Um, we also need to look at the pH, organic acid composition, and various presence of oxidation catalysts um, as well. Some wines can become turbid with only 6 to 8 milligrams per liter of iron, while others can remain clear up to 25 milligrams per liter. Um, what we can see is like if there is at all um, in the winemaking process a lot of oxygen introduced to the wine and any sort of turbidity increased, that's going to be indicative that we are having some sort of redox imbalance, which is going to be related to the presence of oxidation catalysts such as iron and copper. So keep that in mind if you see that after filtration, a, a turbidity increase um, with wines. It could be related to metallic hazes. So now on to copper case. We mainly see this in white wines. Um, it comes off as an amorphous um, deposit with varying pale yellow, green, off-white, brown granular particulates. And its formation conditions, it needs a reduced conditions. That's why we often see it after bottling. Um, unstable protein, uh, we need low iron, um, UV light exposure, and heat. And wines with copper levels greater than 0.5 milligrams per liter are considered uh, susceptible. Now we're gonna be talking about microbiological hazes. And these can be formed from various uh, microorganisms such as fermenting yeast, and often that comes off as a haze or precipitate. Film forming yeast can produce a film or fine haze and or precipitation. Aerobic bacteria can create a surface translucent film. Lactic acid bacteria can produce amorphous sediment or a silky cloud-like haze. And the formation conditions really depend on uh, growth conditions for these microorganisms. So if there's insufficient SO2, we have high pH, air exposure, poor sanitation, or any sort of bottling line contamination, it's going to lend to um, microbial haze risks. And we almost always see typically gas associated with um, with uh, the presence of uh, microbial haze. So keep that in mind and make sure to sanitize and stabilize your wine prior to bottling. So that concludes part one of our series on wine instabilities. I'll catch you guys in part two where we talk about prevention and remediation.